This is a Disney dollar. You can tell it's not a real dollar because Mickey Mouse has not been elected president of the United States. But it's not a fake dollar either. This was a real form of currency that saw use for nearly 30 years. You see, Disney has a very weird history of treating itself like a government. And in fairness to them, that's because they literally are a government. At least in this part of Central Florida, where they can manage their own utilities, issue themselves liquor licenses, and, when the time comes, exercise their legal right to become the world's 10th nuclear power. But since running an autocratic government in the middle of a swamp can get kind of old, Disney decided to take the next step in the late 1980s and start their own currency. Now, this raises a few questions, like, are you actually allowed to do that? And, well, that's the only question. But the answer to that question is kind of complicated. You see, the US Constitution basically just has one vague little sentence about who can print money, and it shockingly doesn't acknowledge the possibility of a privately owned currency printed by a cartoon duck who, guess what, was not even born in the United States. But the consensus seems to be that you can distribute your own private currency if you throw about a hundred asterisks after that sentence. One of these asterisks has to do with how people perceive the currency. If there is any way that someone could confuse it for government-issued money, then the government would issue you a bonk on the head. And this has happened. In the mid-2000s, a guy named Bernard von Nothaus started printing money and minting a new currency called Liberty Dollars. Now, these weren't all that different from other small-scale community currencies like Massachusetts's Berkshires or New York's Ithaca Hours. The problem was that too many people thought that they were official US US currency. After all, they were called dollars, used the dollar sign, said trust in God, came in the exact same denominations as US currency, and the coins looked exactly like US coins except that they had Ron Paul's face on them. And because these two middle-aged men didn't look different enough, the Liberty Dollars were deemed counterfeit, and I was going to make some joke about Nothouse ending up in the Nuthouse, but really he just ended up in federal prison. Now, the other main restriction on private currencies is how they can be used. Disney was not the first company with the bright idea to make their own dollars. That actually started with the coal mining companies of the 19th century. But those coal companies weren't making their own coal bucks as cute souvenirs to remember your time down in the coal mines, they were making them to screw over the proletariat. Basically, since the mining camps didn't usually have much cash on hand, they would pay their workers with their own made-up currency instead. This currency could only be spent at their own stores, and those stores just happened to have terrible, super-inflated prices. This also made it basically impossible for any of the miners to leave, because they had been accumulating their life savings with what were essentially just Chuck E. Cheese tokens that could only be spent on bread at a single tiny shack somewhere in rural West Virginia. Now, these currencies were called company scripts, and they were enough of a problem that Congress had to pass some laws to stop companies from paying their workers with them. Nowadays, it's still legal for a company to create a currency, but that currency has to be easily exchange for real money that can be spent outside the company. So basically, as long as Disney didn't pay their own employees in Disney dollars, and as long as Disney dollars couldn't be mistaken for real dollars, the government couldn't do anything about them. With those two restrictions in mind, the Disney dollar was born in 1987, coming in denominations of 1, 5, 10, and 50. The idea was pretty straightforward. You could buy or spend Disney dollars in any territory of Mickey's empire, namely Disney World, Disneyland, Disney stores, Disney cruise ships, and on Disney's private island in the Caribbean, which is not technically subject to the laws of the United States, but it turns out that the Bahamian Constitution doesn't say anything about privately owned mouse money either. The value of these Disney dollars would be pegged one-to-one -one with the US dollar, and because of the law I mentioned earlier, all of these locations would be legally obligated to buy back any Disney dollars in exchange for real money at any time. Now, I know what you must be thinking. If Disney had to offer me real money for my Disney dollars, wouldn't it be super easy to just counterfeit the fake currency and then use it to drain Disney's enormous coffers to buy myself a jet ski? And that's a great question, but the answer is no. It turns out, Disney dollars were incredibly well engineered and had most of the counterfeit protections that real currencies have. They used the same intaglio microprinting process that the US dollar uses, scan-resistant reflective ink, hidden watermarks, and even unique serial numbers that indicated where they were originally purchased. Also, glitter, because maybe the counterfeiters didn't have a Michaels nearby. Despite their success, Disney eventually discontinued Disney dollars in 2016. They didn't say why, but it was probably because no one carries large large wads of cash around crowded theme parks anymore unless they're trying to make a generous donation to the local pickpockets. Nowadays, Disney resorts have all sorts of futuristic payment technologies that make it way easier to pay for things and way harder to tell how much money you're wasting to stare at the backsides of an Iowa family for an hour in line. For legal reasons, Disney still has to accept any Disney dollars that are still in circulation, but you're probably better off cashing them with Disney adults instead. So depending on where you live, it's probably been pretty darn cold recently. 
It certainly has in the where I live, which has made me especially glad that I use HelloFresh. Just last night, instead of trudging through the snow to buy hugely inflated grocery store ingredients, I received a package on my doorstep that had everything I needed for dinner. It was all perfectly pre-proportioned and came with an easy-to-follow recipe for one of the meals I had chosen the week before. Crispy buffalo spice chicken with scallion mashed potatoes and roasted carrots. The best part is that there was no food waste after I was done, thanks to that portioning, which massively cuts down on my grocery costs and my carbon footprint. I've actually been using HelloFresh for a long time almost a full year before I asked them to sponsor us. They've made it so much easier for me to eat healthier, cook faster, and spend less, and I've gotten better at cooking, too. So I'd encourage you to try HelloFresh. Just click the button on screen or go to HelloFresh.com and use code HI16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts.